What's up, you guys? My name is Dimitri Christie. I'm a real estate broker, investor, and coach here in the Raleigh, North Carolina area. And today I'm going to be talking to you about how to purchase an investment property or a primary residence and offer a lowball offer. Um, we're not talking about offering, you know, hundred thousand dollars less than ask, but there's a great opportunity right now to get a home at a discount. Um, so we're going to talk about how you can go about presenting that offer, what strategies you should use within the other aspects of your offer, because price is just one. There are a number of different aspects to the offer that the seller ends up considering and that can benefit you or benefit the seller one way or the other. So let's dive into it. So first and foremost, we're going to decide whether or not you're going for an investment or for a primary residence. In both cases, I would suggest offering the number that you're most comfortable purchasing at. You're going to be spending the money. So if you're not comfortable spending um, $250,000, then don't offer $250,000. Uh, that's just kind of a baseline approach to buying real estate. Secondarily, uh, I would offer a number that you are comfortable buying. So if it's not $250, but it's $225, so be it. If asking price is $250, it's okay that you offer two. It's okay that you offer two twenty-five. Uh, that's your price range. That's your limit. That's your that's your comfort zone. But knowing that, make sure that you understand it's not likely to get accepted. Maybe it is. Maybe it's not. You don't know the seller's position. So the best thing you can do is focus on your situation as you go forward and submit offers on properties. Now, for a primary residence, the emotion and the uh, need to purchase is quite a bit stronger than for an investment property. An investment property, I would suggest you hold tight and hang on until you get the property at the price that you like. Um, whether you have to go through one, two, three offers or 15 to 20. Being consistent in the um, strategy that you have set out to pursue and making sure that you meet those criteria and guidelines, not pushing above because with the investment, you're looking to make money. With a primary residence, it's a place for you to rest your head, live life, host friends and family, and really, um, that's not likely going to be an investment as a rental property specifically would be. Maybe later down the line you rent it, but on a primary residence, I would recommend offering a number that would get you the home. If you really want it, don't shortchange yourself trying to get a deal. So let's go through some different uh, aspects to the offer that you can consider. Maybe the offer price is not where you go to negotiate with the seller. Maybe you offer asking. So let's break it down. First and foremost, there's the offer price, the sales price of the property. Okay. This is going to be the amount of money the seller is owed at closing. Effectively, the amount of money you have to spend. If you get a mortgage, then you're only paying a down payment uh, out of your pocket, but that money you still owe. So there's the sales price. Then in North Carolina, we have a deposit called due diligence. Due diligence is a non-refundable deposit that goes directly to the seller when your contract is accepted. You're not gonna get that money back. It is over to them. However, if you do close on the property, then it is credited towards your sales price. So it doesn't disappear, but if you back out of the contract, it's all theirs. Another deposit that is available is called the earnest money deposit. It's not looked at as highly in North Carolina because it is refundable as long as you back out during your due diligence period. Um, but that is a, an additional deposit where you can put some big number, 10, 15, 20, $30,000. And it looks like it's a strong offer because the seller knows you have that cash ready and you're giving it to the attorney at closing. So due diligence goes straight to the seller and earnest money goes straight to the attorney to be held in escrow until closing. That way, if you back out during the due diligence period, you get that earnest money back. Or if you move forward with closing, both of those deposits are credited towards your sales price. So another uh, opportunity to negotiate is the due diligence period. You don't actually have to put any due diligence money to get granted a due diligence period, effectively an inspection period, but it is definitely uh, more advantageous for the seller to accept a contract that has due diligence. You're more committed, they're expecting you to close. Even if something comes up, 
then they know that you have money on the line. So it would have to be bad enough that you'd be willing to give up that money to back out of the contract. It really helps all parties stay secured to that property, to that purchase and committed to the transaction. But on the buying side, if you're able to put no money down, then that's a great opportunity to uh, protect yourself going into a property where you may not know what's wrong with it. So those are some different deposits and numbers associated to the purchase. Um, another number that is commonly used is seller concessions. So this is money that the seller essentially gives back to you uh, at closing. It comes from the purchase price, so they're not coming cash out of pocket to provide that, but they are uh, still reducing that from the sales price that they take home. The seller concessions can be used for a variety of reasons, a variety of ways, and they're extremely beneficial, oftentimes, in my opinion, more beneficial than getting a reduction in sales price. Seller concessions can be used towards your out-of-pocket uh, closing costs. So you have to pay attorneys, you have to pay surveys, you have to pay uh, the county, things like that. Those amounts can be uh, covered by closing costs. Additionally, you can buy down your interest rate. In this time, here we are, October 2023, interest rates just hit about 8% for a primary residence, um, and that's on a 30-year fixed. So one thing you could do is use closing cost credits, seller credits, to buy down your interest rate permanently. There's something called a 321 where you can buy it down over the first three years and then it's right back up to where you originally were set. I don't like those because you're still locked into a high interest rate. I want to buy it down permanently over the 30 years of the loan and never have to worry because if interest rates go up, if proper va property values go up, whatever it may be, you're not counting on a refinance. It's an option, but you're not counting on it. I like to permanently reduce that with closing cost credits. Another thing you could purchase is home price index protection. So home price index protection is a product offered by a company called ResiTrade. And what they allow is you buy a contract, it's 12 months, they're 12 month contracts. And if your home value drops over 10% over the time of that contract, then they automatically pay you out. You can get coverage up to $100,000 and this is going to be huge in the event of a market correction or just property values dipping in your area um, because we're at all-time highs right now so this is something else that can be covered and by your closing cost credits another thing that you can use is uh, called a home warranty so home warranties just like the home price index protection i just mentioned they actually cover the appliances and the systems of your home so that's a policy that you can get through a home warranty company and pay for it through seller credits. They're very versatile. I usually like to ask for seller credits on every purchase. Um, sometimes clients, they'd rather not, they take a um, the reduction in price, but it's up to everyone's own discretion. So two other areas that you can negotiate, a few other areas you can negotiate are the due diligence period. So how long do you need for your inspection period? Because as soon as that's up, the seller knows you're going to commit to the contract. You're going to commit to the purchase. And again, it instills more confidence in the transaction. So usually uh, we shoot for 14 to 21 days on the buying side for due diligence. That gives you plenty of time, not only for inspections and secondary inspections, but also for um, appraisals to come through and underwriting to really be solidified. And so that you know for sure, for sure, the property is gonna appraise and that there's nothing wrong um, and you're gonna continue forward with that transaction on the buying side. Then additionally, this applies to primary or secondary, uh, primary or investment properties. But if you wanna get really aggressive, then I would go with seven day or 10 day due diligence period. Another part of the contract that you can negotiate on is the closing period. So when does a seller need to close? I just got a client under contract and the reason our contract was picked is because we could close by the seller's closing date. We weren't looking to go 45 days out. The seller needed to close in 28, so that's what we offered and our contract got picked. So understanding what the seller needs, um, if they need 45 days, if they need 60 days and you have the flexibility, then okay, maybe you offer it like that so that they can stay in the home longer. Um, it all depends. If there's a tenant in the, your investment property that their lease ends in 60 days, so you write the contract out as such. 
So negotiating a contract is not only about the sales price and quite often using other aspects of the contract to get better terms uh, can really help you in the long term, whether it be on your monthly payments, your overall interest rates, your systems being covered, your home value being covered, your out of pocket costs being reduced. And if you have any questions at all, please leave them here in the comments, send them my way through email over on Instagram, DM me. And if you're interested in buying real estate, whether it be a primary residence or an investment property, I help individuals build wealth through real estate. So go ahead and click the link in the description where you can book a call with me. Fill out some questions so I can understand what you're looking to do and where you're at. And then let's get on a call and let's talk. Let's strategize and let me help you build wealth in real estate.